Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here we have another episode of the top ten best films of some of the greatest directors in the history of cinema. Naturally, I am starting from ten and then slashing my way. Up to number one, and it is quite possible that I have seen every film that is attainable by these artists. So, needless to say, these lists come from truthfully passionate and honourable accuracy. <laughs> Thank you for hearing me, folks. If you can't tell, I am so excited to talk about one of the greatest and influential auteurs in film that continues to inspire filmmakers across the world. His name is Sir Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Joseph Hitchcock was born in Essex, which was east of London, being the youngest of three children. His parents were greengrocers and went on to own more shops over time. Hitchcock was always known as a quote unquote well-behaved boy, but certain experiences played a huge part on his films to come, such as taking a note his father gave him one day and then telling Alfred to go to the police. The policeman read the note and locked Alfred up in a cell, saying, "This is what we do to naughty little boys." Needless to say, Alfred was frightened of the police ever since. Even refusing to drive for fear of getting a ticket. Also, growing up in a religious family where corporal punishment was still a method of choice back then, which fear progressed even more. Also, he was frightened of eggs. He just didn't like them. <laughs> he actually studied loads of subjects in school, as mechanics, engineering, political science, and then after World War One, he went to study creative writing and got an opportunity to be a founding editor of the Henley Telegraph. Writing several short stories, which then led him to working with the famous Players Lasky, the division of Paramount Pictures, whom were opening a new studio in London, where he would eventually meet his future wife of 54 years, Alma Revel. He hopped from one production company to the next, gaining more experience, more confidence, as many of the producers sought the young 20-something Hitchcock as a young man with a master mind. He always loved that headline for himself. German cinema was very much a big influence on Hitchcock, particularly F. W. Murnau, and with his in-depth experience on themes of mortality, death, romance, the invigoration of crime and punishment, he was able to bring a different flair to his movies that were going to just explode on the public like never before. My dear friends, I always say on every video that it is going to be tough, <laughs> but Alfred Hitchcock is truly on another level. He is easily one of my personal favorite directors and storytellers in all of film, and I join the club of millions on that, no question. I can remember the very first time discovering this man by watching a silly little tour video, which came out in 1994, called "Universal Studios Florida: Experience the Magic of Movie Making," hosted by John Forsyth. Does anybody remember this video? Oh, please do comment. Let me get an amen on that one. I watched this video constantly as a kid. I must have been about six years old, and if you've seen it, you must remember the Alfred Hitchcock segment where the park plays such a huge tribute to the master himself. They use, of course, the Psycho House, rebuilding it in Florida, the Rear Window experience, the Saboteur experience, and all that. I was utterly fascinated by his personality, his dry sense of humor, and his. Captivating presence, which led to me watching a bunch of his films, which of course pulled up on TCM, and this child was inspired to the moon and back to create visual storytelling like he had. Just the way his films move is just so captivating. He directs a camera and shows us a narrative on screen like I've never seen before. That's why this video will be extremely challenging to me. Almost every film he has made is a masterpiece. Now, granted, not all of them are perfect, but speaking from an artist's point of view, they're all experimental. 
He was a true artist that loved to experiment. Even looking at his beginnings in London, such as his first major thriller, The Lodger, The Story of the London Fog, which talks about Jack the Ripper, which is his most German expressionistic film, or even The Lady Vanishes. My God, the train sequences are just stunning. Needless to say, I could easily do a top 30 for him. No question. But we must respect the rules and regulations because without them, there would be chaos. And no one wants that. Well, except in film. Much more than a film director, he was just an unbelievable figure in pop culture and audiences were gravitated towards him thanks to his brilliant cameos in all of his films, but his masterful television creation, that is Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which premiered in 1955 and then leading into the Alfred Hitchcock Hour. These shows are just truly gripping, amazing stories, with Hitchcock directing 17 of them, my personal favorite being Lambs to the Slaughter, of course, written by Roald Dahl. What fond memories I have of doing homework as a teen staying up late watching Nick at Night, and then seeing Alfred Hitchcock pop right up on your television, hosting these amazing, thought-provoking, half-hour pieces of entertainment. The show was so huge, inspiring a whole string of anthological series, like my major personal favorite, The Twilight Zone, among many more, including the new Cabinet of Curiosities, produced by Guillermo del Toro. I can go on all day about my love for his films, folks, and I'll try to spare you not doing too much of his accent. I should like to address the top 10 best films directed by the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. Starting off at number 10, we have Lifeboat, which is such a fantastic film based on an original story by one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, John Steinbeck. You have a simple and yet politically challenging story of a group of survivors of a torpedoed merchant ship in the middle of the Atlantic trying to stay alive as World War II rages on around them. Not to mention one of the survivors being a German off of the U-boat that sank their ship. It's a fantastic cast, especially the scene-stealing and iconic Tallulah Banquet, which was genius casting on Hitchcock's part. The fact that this was all shot on a soundstage brings me more respect to his art of movie making. He absolutely hated doing on location shots because of the unexpected weather and the unexpected background noise that you would get. At least for a soundstage, you can control all that. This was still a technically difficult production involving the constant water splashing, the hot lights for the cinematography, which resulted in many of the cast members getting sick. One of my favorite stories on this it's kind of crazy, is how Tallulah Bankhead was notorious for never wearing underwear. The cast got used to it over time until a production official noticed this and urged Hitchcock to tell her to put some freaking underwear on. Hitch said, well, it's not my job. It could be wardrobe, makeup, or a hairdresser. Good God, Hitchcock had an amazing sense of humor. His camera work with the ensemble and the boat is just incredible, which earned him his second Academy Award nomination for Best Director. Alongside the film's two other nods for Best Original Story for Steinbeck and Best Black and White Cinematography. However, at this time, some films can get all the nominations in the world, but commercially it can bomb, which is what happened, and Zanuck did nothing to save it. Agreeing with the critics and how sympathetic to the Nazis it was? Completely missing the point, obviously, but you know what? It has gained its respect over time, and I strongly feel it is a strong piece of filmmaking for Hitchcock, trying to give a strong message about the power of allies. Oh, and there's Hitchcock right there. Do you see him? Also, one of his most brilliant cameos. Number nine, Notorious. I wish, ladies and gentlemen, that this could be much, much higher, because this is one of the greatest romance spy thrillers I've ever seen. Based on a short story, but given an original treatment by the amazing screenwriter Ben Hecht, it tells the story of the daughter of a German criminal who was recently sentenced to prison. The daughter is approached by government agents to spy on her father's Nazi scientist cohorts and basically go undercover to gather more information, which leads to that wonderful MacGuffin of uranium. 
The challenge is, Alicia and Devlin, the woman and the government agent, fall in love with each other. With her going undercover, leading to marrying the Nazi scientist, Alex, Devlin begins to grow colder and colder towards her as she is literally falling apart as well. Because she doesn't love Alex, she loves Devlin. Ugh, romantic drama at its best. Hitchcock guides us through this love story with such a mystical and luxuriating eye. We are always swept up in the romance between Alicia and Devlin, which by the way, Ingrid Bergman and Cary Grant are absolutely outstanding in this picture. It is a dramatic side of Grant that not many of us see, and damn are we glad that we get it. And Bergman, well, everyone loves Ingrid. Even Hitchcock, you can say this was among the first of his obsessions, so to speak, with his leading ladies. I just love how he guides the camera on Grant and Bergman as they're kissing and kissing each other while Grant is on the phone for crying out loud. It's quite hilarious and adorable. It is brilliant storytelling, not to mention the horse racing scene after Alicia sleeps with Alex. Dry your eyes, baby, they're out of character. Oh, so damn good. Or the very end with the extended stare sequence. It's just mesmerizing, suspenseful work. Notorious was only nominated for two Oscars for Best Screenplay and Best Supporting Actor for Claude Rains. And damn it, he is just so damn great in this as well. But its legacy is much, much stronger today and is often cited as one of the greatest romance thrillers of all time, even cited as famed critic Roger Ebert's favorite and Hitchcock's own precious daughter, Patricia Hitchcock's personal favorite of her father's. Oh, oh, and there's Hitchcock right there. Do you see him? Number eight, Strangers on a Train. Again, I really, really wish this was much higher because this was at one point, ladies and gentlemen, my favorite Hitchcock film for quite a long while. Based on the novel by Patricia Highsmith, it tells the story of two different men. One, a tennis professional, Guy Haynes, who really hates his wife, and the other, a spoiled rich son, Bruno Antony, who hates his father. They meet for the first time on a train, just casually talking, which leads to Bruno getting the idea of them swapping murders. Swap murders. <laughs> Guy dismisses the whole thing until Bruno actually performs the deed. And the stalking progresses for Guy to fulfill his hand of the bargain. This film went through writer hell for a long while, with famed mystery author Raymond Chandler dismissing the whole process with Hitchcock. But hey, he still gets a credit. Still, the story is fleshed out wonderfully, thanks to the terrific performances by Farley Granger and, of course, Robert Walker. My lord, why he was not nominated for an Academy Award for his devilish yet three-dimensional portrayal, I will never know. His speech that he has with Granger is just, among many of his speeches, are just so powerful. This is also a wondrous and eye-sucking expression of Hitchcock's genius with the camera, not without the help of DP Robert Burks. Let's be clear on that. For the scene where Miriam Haynes is walking by herself, looking to light her cigarette, the light comes on. Pardon me, is your name Miriam? Why, yes, yes it is. Light off. Boom, into the strangling, with just the carnival noises in the back. Her glasses are knocked off, and we see this horror reflected from her glass lens on the ground. I remember that chilling me to the bone when I first saw this, as a kid, and not, 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 not much has changed. Funny enough, this film was critically mixed when it was released in 1951, but it certainly was profitable, resulting in its sole Academy Award nomination for Best Black and White Cinematography. Now it is rightfully looked at as a true classic among the most suspenseful, inspiring films, which inspired the utterly classic film itself, Throw Mama from the Train, which I love as well. Crisscross. Oh, 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 and there he is again. Do you see him? Love it. Number seven, Rebecca. Oh my God, ladies and gentlemen, I honestly wish, again, I sound like a broken record, I wish this was much, much higher because it most certainly deserves to be. It is, in my opinion, the only amazing film adaptation of Daphne du Maurier's classic novel, starring Laurence Olivier and Joan Fontaine as the classic lovers Maxim and Mrs. de Winter. I just love that she has no name 
It creates such a devastating mystery and anticipation on what is to happen. If you don't know the story, a very meek lady falls in love with the rich and yet withdrawn Maxim de Winter. They marry and he takes her to his gigantic mansion in Cornwall, where the lady meets the crew and the mysterious housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers, played absolutely brilliantly by Dame Judith Anderson. As the new Mrs. De Winter starts to become comfortable in her new home, she really notices the deep effect Maxim's previously deceased wife, Rebecca, had on the house, which grows into more paranoia and fear for her own life. The craftsmanship on this film adaptation is among the absolute best, and many book aficionados will complain all day about the inaccuracies to the book, which I understand, but Hitchcock knew that Du Maurier's book was such a thrilling masterpiece of literature. So why even bother adapting brilliance to the screen? You're just setting yourself up for more and more criticism. So Hitchcock really wanted to make his own interpretation and picturization of the celebrated novel because there's also only so much from the book that can be translated to the screen. The sequence when Mrs. De Winter is looking out the window and Mrs. Danvers is basically just egging her on, influencing her ever so gently and chillingly to kill herself. It's so unbelievably chilling. The cinematography here by George Barnes is just gorgeous, and the design and scale through the whole estate is just monumental. I get chills just by how cold it feels. The performances obviously are second to none, with Olivier Fontaine and Anderson in Academy Award nominated performances. This was the film that really catapulted Hitchcock into Hollywood. Honestly, thanks to the infamous and temperamental independent producer, David O. Selznick. Selznick was known to be such a controlling nut over every aspect of the production. He pulled through with all his might and turned in one of the greatest gothic romance mysteries of all time, nominated for 11 Oscars, including Hitchcock's first nomination for Best Director. And miraculously enough, it won two of those Oscars for Best Black and White Cinematography and Best Picture of the Year. And hey, do you see Hitchcock now? Do you see him? Oh, there he is. Awesome. Number six, The Birds. One of the very first films I've ever seen of the man, which I know firsthand many people have experienced the same thing. After my fun discovery of Hitchcock through Universal Studios Florida, I remember my mother showing me The Birds. And ladies and gentlemen, was I ever freaked out just by the opening credits with no score except the flapping wings and bird squeals. Jesus, it's already such a piece that makes you shiver for what's to happen. And it's kind of hilarious with how the film starts too, because we see the beautiful Tippi Hedren enter a pet shop and oh, there's Hitchcock again. Did you see him? She meets Rod Taylor and they begin a little flirtation. Tippi has a strong attraction for Rod Taylor and she drives down to Bodega Bay with the lovebirds to give to his 11-year-old sister. Once Tippi arrives into town, this is when things start to get more and more interesting. We see a seagull do a flyby attack on Tippi, a dead gull on the doorstep of Suzanne Plachette and Tippi, and then a whole flock attacking the kids at Cartwright's birthday party. We are bewildered and really want to know what the frick is going on. And the beautiful thing is, Hitchcock never tells us, except for what is left in our interpretation. It was honestly the most technically difficult film Hitchcock made to this point, with coordinating and choreographing the shots with the birds, but it works so well. I have too many favorite scenes in this film, but everyone loves the scene of Tippi Hedren waiting outside the school, smoking a cigarette, when one by one, a crow sits on top of the jungle gym, during the horrendous razzle dee razzle dee now, now, now. God, it goes on forever. And then we reveal the whole jungle gym covered with crows. It's like, oh my God, what's gonna happen? The famous diner and gas station sequence is just genius. Side note, yes, this was not a good reflection of Hitchcock around this time, since he was very much obsessed with Tippi Hedren, casting her based on just a commercial he saw of her. He did take things way too far and out of line, without a doubt, putting regulations on her, which led him to sexual advances on Tippi when they worked on Marnie right after this film. A terrible blacklist was put upon Tippi by Hitchcock, basically ruining her career, and it just paints the true story on how flawed 
Hitchcock was at that point. You know what I always say, right? Nobody's perfect. And I'm sorry, that doesn't excuse that action, of course not. But as a filmmaker himself, that was never bled into the narrative. Tippy said so herself. She was brave and mature enough to separate the man from the artist. And as a director, he was truly wonderful. The whole event was dramatized in the BBC film, The Girl, with Sienna Miller and Toby Jones, who is the best Hitchcock I've seen on screen so far. Hitchcock was still a man of his work, and whenever I look back on The Birds, I still consider it one of the great achievements in movie magic, earning an Oscar nomination for best visual effects. I mean, look at how he created the illusion of the door opening towards the end, when there was no door. That's just so cool. Number five, North by Northwest. Oh man, I don't know if this is disappointing to some because I know a lot of artists that classify this film as their personal favorite. And obviously, I just love the hell out of this film because of how adventurous, mysterious, sexy, and suave it is. Notably, as one of the great pictures, if not the picture, to have inspired the James Bond series. Telling the story of an ad executive, Roger Thornhill, played magnificently by Cary Grant, who gets caught up in a government spy ring, being framed for murder, being mistaken for a government agent, resulting in some of the greatest suspenseful action sequences in film. Seriously, Hitchcock molds Cary Grant as one of the best unofficial James Bonds ever. <laughs> But certainly it is different because this guy isn't a secret agent. He's just a normal ad executive guy who gets caught up in all this. And it's quite genuine acting from Grant. Ava Marie Saint's performance is majestic. Cast against type as a sexy, mysterious agent, which nobody expected. And she blows it out of the water. The whole ensemble is fantastic. James Mason, games and especially Martin Landau, who used a bit of gay subtext for his character as well. More than anything, of course, what absolutely gives this film its glorious and epic juice is frickin' Bernard Herrmann's genius and underrated score to this film. He is honestly not appreciated enough. Every time I hear his score, I hear a future John Williams cultivating Indiana Jones, or John Barry composing James Bond, among countless, countless others who without a doubt were inspired by his themes. I just love how this whole creation was formed from an ending standpoint of Hitchcock just wanting to shoot a finale at Mount Rushmore and filling in how to get there. And that finale is just exciting. And even though they shot it at a soundstage, since they were prohibited to shoot it at the actual monument, I am still hanging on for dear life when it comes to them fighting and hanging off of frickin' Washington's neck. <laughs> this film is so much fun. It was nominated for three Oscars, including Best Screenplay by Ernest Lehman, and always will be regarded as one of the greatest movies of all time. And I love his cameo in this one most of all. It's most definitely my favorite cameo of his. Number four, Shadow of a Doubt. Do I have to say it again? Okay, yes. I really do. I really personally wish this was much, much higher because of how wholesome it is. It is reportedly, in Hitchcock's own words, his favorite film in his whole filmography, simply because he absolutely loved the theme of a menace entering into a small town. It is extremely easy to see why when you have a screenplay refined by Hitch's wife, Alma, and Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Thornton Wilder, the acclaimed author of Our Town, who is just the most perfect author to do this because Wilder was able to feed into all those American familial ideals and themes, which sets up Hitchcock to flesh out the darkness of it all. The performances, I mean, oh, Teresa Wright is just wonderful as Charlie, who wants something more in life, and her world is rejuvenated again when her uncle Charlie comes to town for a visit. All is great at first, until she notices something different about Uncle Charlie. Could he be the Merry Widow murderer? Joseph Cotton is just perfect as Uncle Charlie, charming and chilling at the same time. We get some more outrageous comedy between Henry Travers and Hume Cronin discussing how they would commit the perfect murder. And they keep discussing it every time they meet. It's so Hitchcock. 
Hitchcock just knows how to build suspense through a terrorizing story of your beloved uncle who you idolize and love with all your heart, but is a murderer. The ending, of course, gets me going every time, too, which I won't spoil it. I will not. You need to see it, of course. Nominated for only one Oscar for its amazing screenplay, it is still quite underrated. Oh, and there he is again. Number three, Rear Window. What a true classic that audiences and critics alike love and appreciate to this day. And again, it truly deserves it. Based on the short story, It Had to Be Murder by Cornell Woolrich. It stars one of Hitchcock's favorite leading men and one of my personal favorites as well, Jimmy Stewart as Jeff, a photographer with a broken leg, cooped up in his Greenwich Village apartment, doing what many people do, spying on their neighbors. <laughs> I'm kidding. All is mundane and delightful until he suspects a man across the courtyard potentially murdering his wife. He enlists the help of his dear girlfriend, Lisa, played lavishly by Princess Grace Kelly, and Stella, the legendary Thelma Ritter. This film is just fan-freaking-tastic. It holds up thrillingly today and should be one of the first movies to be watched by anyone who does not know the genius of Hitchcock. This was filmed on a 98-foot wide, 148-foot long, and 40-feet high constructed set, consisting of 31 apartments, eight of them being fully furnished with electricity and running water. The cast could actually live in these, which some of them did. The whole sequence of Jeff looking upon each tenant from apartment to apartment is just incredible camera work. Once again, with the help of DP Robert Burks, with his Academy Award nominated cinematography again here. The great Perry Mason as the alleged villain here. And he is frightening in this, my god. Besides the suspense you feel, there's a wonderful amount of comedy in this, especially between Stella and Jeff. But we mustn't forget the terror we experience when Lisa sneaks into Thorvald's apartment to investigate, and he shows back up. Lisa is trying to create a story. I love that we don't hear anything except the Penissimo piano in the background. Jeff and Stella are scared to death, and then Thorvald grabs her, she screams to Jeff, looking out the window. Lights turn out. Jeff is shaking, and we are crumbling right along with him as he cries out, oh, What do I do? It's one of the greatest moments of suspense ever. This film was nominated for four Oscars, including Hitchcock's fourth nod for Best Director, and has often inspired such neighborly spy thrillers like Disturbia, 53 years later, and of course the remake of Weird Window with Christopher Reeve, which came out in 1998. And look, there's Hitchcock again. Number two, Vertigo. If this one is surprising to the lot of you, check yourself before you wreck yourself. This film, ladies and gentlemen, has been defined as one of Hitchcock's most defining films of his career. Once again, the major factor that gives this film its soul-capturing essence oh, is Bernard Herrmann's iconic score. His prelude right when the movie starts is just dazzling. You already have my attention. We have our opening credit sequence, then a thrilling rooftop chase. We meet our hero, Scotty Ferguson, played expertly by Jimmy Stewart, who is dangling from a building. He experiences vertigo, propelling from the huge fear of heights. A patrolman tries to help him up, but falls off the building to his death. Whew, talk about needing a retirement. Scotty tries to conquer his fear, but his ex fiance and friend shares that maybe another emotional shock will cure it. He then is hired to follow a friend's wife, Madeline because she's been acting strangely, and step by step, we see Scotty and ourselves falling in love with the suicide-driven Madeline. But then, once they reach a bell tower, another horrible event occurs, which, honestly, I, I can't go much further and spoil it for you guys. If you have not seen this film, it is just too good, too amazing to spoil, because we go through some wild twists and turns here, and heart-wrenching moments and images that truly stay with you long after the film is over. I will admit, folks, when I first saw this film, I was not really captivated. I just didn't get it. I mean, of course, I was probably 13 when I first saw this, so some things clearly went over my head, but it took me 
two more times of seeing it. And of course, now, as an adult, I am truly obsessed with this film. This is Hitchcock at honestly his most experimental. When he was on top of the world at this time, and being in his late 50s, directing this as well. Which goes to show you how much of a true artist Hitchcock was to tell a story with these themes of overcoming fear, falling in love, but fighting your inhibitions and morale to get what you want. And Hitchcock gives you all of these classic motifs and then shatters it right in our faces. As Brian De Palma puts it, being one of Hitchcock's most devoted invisible prodigies, he shows you in this movie what a director does, basically, how he creates these illusions and then kills them. It has often been said as well, this is a director's movie, and almost kind of a reflection on how Hitchcock himself treats leading ladies and how a director can actually create and build the power of a leading lady. As I said before, it's the game of suspense with Hitchcock that he just loves to play and I love every minute of it. Another thing that really sets it apart from a lot of his other films is one word, color. Color, color, color. Using Robert Burke's The DP Extraordinaire using the dolly zoom, where the camera is physically moving away from the foreground while simultaneously zooming in, also known today as the vertigo effect. This movie has always been held high on a film nerd's pedestal, <laughs> and it's absolutely clear to see why, because of all the visuals, they are all so damn effective, creepy, sexy, and luscious. Oh, oh, and do you see Hitchcock there? There he is. It's not surprising on how this film was mixed when it came out because audiences certainly were not ready for it, even though it was nominated for two Oscars, including Best Art Direction and Sound. But now, of course, it remains one of the greatest classic romance thrillers in the history of cinema, spawning such great replicants of it, like Brian De Palma's Obsession, which was also scored by Herman, Mel Brooks' High Anxiety, <laughs> and even David Lynch's Mulholland Drive. If anyone ever gets the chance to see this film on the big screen or experience it with a live orchestra, oh, for the love of film, please take that opportunity. You surely won't regret the majesty and what is popularly known as Hitchcock's Lost Masterpiece. And now we will talk about some honorable mentions. The Trouble with Harry. I really love this film, and it is without a doubt one of Hitchcock's best dark comedies. Based on the novel, it's a simple story of how nine residents of a beautiful village in high water Vermont discover a dead body, poor Harry, on top of a hillside, and they all try to figure out what to do with the body. <laughs> it's really hilarious, as Harry is basically a MacGuffin. And yes, it focuses on the people themselves. It was a box office disappointment, unfortunately. And yes, it's not that great of a film, but it did introduce the film world to Shirley MacLaine in her first movie here. Oh, 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 and there's Hitchcock again. Rope, a fantastic play adaptation, which was adapted by frequent collaborator Hume Cronin, but refined by Arthur Lawrence. I just love this story, which is basically based on the uh, Leopold and Loeb case. The story of two pretentious students who murder their former classmate by strangling him with rope and then hide him in a large wooden chest right before they start a frickin' dinner party. But can Philip keep it together and not freak out about being a murderer? Come on, man. Get it together. His freakouts are almost causing the high suspicion from their professor, Rupert, played wonderfully by Jimmy Stewart in Hitchcock and Stewart's first collaboration together. John Dahl and Farley Granger are just fantastic together. And call me crazy, but I love theater pieces adapted into movies that film it like a play. If it works for the material, of course. Like, if people always complain play to film adaptations are just too claustrophobic, they're too tight within the frame, well, I think that certainly works here. You need to feel the tension, knowing there's a freaking dead body in that chest through the whole picture. And whenever anyone gets closer and closer to it, we get excited. Plus, like the genius Hitchcock was, he shot it like a play with long, continuous shots, up to 10 minutes per shot. And I love that. 
People have dismissed this film for a long time, which baffles me. And there is Hitchcock again outside, but also blinking right there, apparently. Did you get that? Yeah, it took me a while to see that. Dial M for Murder. Again, another great play adaptation written by the fantastic Friedrich Knott, telling the simple story of retired tennis player Tony, played amazingly by Ray Milan, honestly one of his best roles, who plots a murder on his wife, Margot, the beautiful Grace Kelly, because of her affair with writer Mark. He hires Charles, an old classmate, and basically blackmails him to perform the murder. And the setup is just delicious. The camera work again by Hitchcock never loses its pace. The actual murder scene itself with how Tony is supposed to call, but he's a little late because someone's using the damn payphone, which sends Charles and us in a frenzy. It's amazing how Hitchcock can make us freak out and care for people committing horrible crimes on screen with his proper use of suspense. And then we get a tense payoff with the murder being committed and how Grace strikingly grabs those scissors and then boom, right in the back. Oh, it is fantastic. We now have a scene stealing John Williams, not that John Williams, <laughs> trying to solve the case and he's just perfect as the inspector. Play adaptations never really work unless you have an amazing cast and again, a director who can honor the play as written and keep the suspense factor intact, especially with majority of the film set in the interior. Oh, 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 and there's Hitchcock again in the photograph. You see him? That was a clever cameo. Spellbound, based on the novel The House of Dr. Eduardus, a great and wild story about Dr. Constance Peterson, a wonderful Ingrid Bergman falling in love with Gregory Peck. She soon discovers he is an imposter, suffering from dissociative amnesia, and could have been the man who murdered the real Dr. Eduardus. This film really surprised me actually when I first saw it because I wasn't too interested at first, but after the first 20 minutes, I was engrossed. Once again, the camera work is just dazzling and geez Louise, when it gets to the imagery of John's psychoanalysis, oh my God. This imagery created by Hitchcock and legendary artist Salvador Dali is something that will stay with viewers for years and years to come. That whole sequence was actually originally 20 minutes long, but of course, frickin' Selznick had to cut it down. But even with Selznick's in influence, this film broke some barriers with its use of nymphomaniacs, sex menacing, and how suicide is performed. The film resulted in six Oscar nominations, one of them being for Hitchcock for Best Director. And this film won composer Miklos Roskas, first Oscar for his breathtaking score. It is truly a wild trip into the mind of a troubled patient that you won't forget. Oh, oh, and there he is again in the back there. You see Hitchcock? Suspicion. Why do people dismiss this film? I, I will never understand. It's half and half, but honestly folks, I think this is one hell of a film with Joan Fontaine in her Oscar-winning performance, and honestly, the only Oscar-winning performance in a Hitchcock film, period. Can you believe that? But Fontaine is Lena, a shy, meek woman, almost like the lady in Rebecca, but more mature here, and she ends up falling in love and marrying Johnny, played with such class and menacing charm by Cary Grant. All is great between he and Monkey Face, as he calls her, until we find out how much of a lying, cheating, dishonest, and penniless scoundrel he is, that we suspect that he is trying to murder Lena for her money. Like Rebecca, it still creates such tension, and what really makes it work is the trust of the actors and how vividly Hitchcock guides the camera. It's truly amazing, the sinister image of the glowing glass of milk that Johnny carries up the stairs sends chills down my spine to this day. And Hitchcock is giving us such a visionary image that something awful is in that milk. It's actually a light bulb, <laughs> which is brilliant. After watching it more and more, I just love how the ending is still open-ended. You really do not know if Johnny is going to change personally or with that arm around her, is he going to try something else to kill her? Oh, I love it. And yes, sir, there is Hitch again. Don't you just love his cameos? I, I can't help myself. Number one, 
Ladies and gentlemen, Psycho. Was there ever any doubt? I mean, how can it not be? This is without question Hitchcock's most popular, most shocking, most thrilling, well-recognized masterpiece, most definitely. You must know, ladies and gentlemen, Psycho is one of my favorite movies of all time, period. I didn't see this film all the way through until I was about nine years old, and even then, I understood this was a film of major significance from its opening title sequence, the drama between Marion Crane and Sam Loomis. You see him in the back there before Marion shows up in the bank. Yep, there he is. To Marion's embezzlement of the deposit money on the run, really bringing out Hitchcock's fear of the police in quite a hurry. Hitchcock really, really is a master of putting us in the shoes of every protagonist. And Marion Crane is just as significant. Janet Leigh's Academy Award nominated performance is truly incredible. Just for every one of her scenes where the camera just focuses on her driving with the voices in her head in the background that she's imagining, it's truly almost psychopathically masterclass acting. And then, oh, we arrive at the Bates Motel where we meet Norman, played with, again, such brilliance by Anthony Perkins. If you want to talk about one of the greatest and one of my favorite and chilling scenes in any movie period, it's the one scene where Norman and Marion get to know each other while she eats dinner in the motel. The comfortability is brewing. We really get to like Norman. And once we cut deeper about mother, a boy's best friend is his mother. Oh man, do we see something different. We all go a little mad sometimes, don't you? It's just chilling, utterly chilling. The famous shower scene, oh my God, folks, the shock of it, the stabbing sequence with the editing, the full completion of the scene with Marion just lying there with her staring at us, never loses its, its gripping touch. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> I could sit here all day and go scene by scene with you guys, but we'd be here all day. <laughs> But folks, this film remains one of the greatest films in horror and cinema, period, based on Hitchcock's mastery of the genre of suspense. Of course, this film would be nothing without the whole ensemble, breathtaking cinematography, amazing writing, and the cherry on top, Bernard Herrmann's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant score for this film. Why on God's green earth Herman wasn't nominated for best score at the Oscars on top of the many other scores that he has done for Hitchcock, I will never ever know. It just elevates the drama even more. I just love how Hitchcock made this film as such a huge and popular device for audiences with his six minute trailer that he filmed, just touring the Bates Motel and the Bates household promoting and campaigning for it heavily, with Paramount believing it would be a box office failure. Can you believe that? They gave Hitchcock 60% of the film's gross profits, which resulted in Hitchcock becoming a very rich man, earning millions of dollars. There are just so many magical things Hitchcock incorporated, like the chocolate syrup for blood, the white and then black bras from Marion really painting the difference of when she's angelic and then now when she's going to the darker side. The dreamlike falling sequence for Arbogast that just sticks with you for years and years. Of course, the main flaw of this film is the final scene with the psychiatrist that explains everything, which Hitchcock hated himself. It does truly slow everything down, but we get the true and epic ending with one of the most chilling monologues given by Mrs. Bates in the mind of Norman with the camera just slowly zooming in on him. Tony Perkins just unbelievably terrifying with that final, they'll see, they'll see and they'll know. And they'll say, why, she wouldn't even harm a fly. The success of Psycho resulted in only four Academy Award nominations, including best director for Hitchcock, which he should have 110% won. But you know what, folks? Hitchcock has the last laugh since Psycho is featured on every major magazine, film preservation board, critic circle, etc. as the inspiration for the true slasher film and one of the greatest films of all time. 
the remake in 1998? We will not talk about that, please. <laughs> Importantly, Hitchcock was not the artist he was without his amazing wife, Alma, helping him through and through with the whole writing storyboarding process. She has helped Hitchcock practically guide the films herself because she herself was a director, writer, and editor, so she knew storytelling. If Alma didn't like a script, then Hitchcock wouldn't even bother. That was his favorite part of the whole creative process, working on scripts and storyboarding. Their relationship was dramatized in the film Hitchcock, starring Anthony Hopkins and Helen Mirren, which I really don't like, to be honest. But it's true that Hitchcock's films were still very much hers as well. And I love how they still had a loving family relationship. Pat Hitchcock has said her childhood was always filled with such happiness. And she respected the true patience Hitch had on all of his sets. There are so many things to say about Alfred Hitchcock. So many thoughts, so many life-changing things for any artist to experience when you watch his films. And it's no wonder why during the major studio collapse in the 60s, Hitchcock was absolutely among the first directors, young and up-and-coming auteurs, were interviewing and learning from personally, like Peter Bogdanovich, Brian De Palma, and Francois Truffaut, of course among many, many, many others. It shocks me to this day how an influential director like him has never won an Oscar for directing, excluding the Irving Thalberg Memorial Oscar he received in 1968 for his work in cinema. He has received the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award, BAFTA Fellowship, Knighthood in 1980, four months before he passed away, and nine of his films are in the National Film Registry. Funny enough, all nine of those films are in my top 10. In the beginning, he was a clever up and comer. In the middle, he was a brilliant genius. And now he is truly the master of not just suspense, but of the art of cinema. Well put, I hope Hitch would say. <laughs> Now, tell me, boys and girls, did I miss any of your favorites? What are your favorite and from what you believe are the best films done by the Grand Master himself? Please share in the comments below, tell all your friends, and it certainly doesn't hurt to hit the subscribe button and like as well, as well as ringing the happy bell right there to stay updated on more content to come. Oh, you can also follow me on Patreon and get greater content there if you'd like. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you so very much for watching, and please, have a safe and happy Halloween.